This morning we're going to be covering a good chunk of ground in Luke chapter 20. Uh, so I invite you to turn in your Bibles there right away. Uh, we're going to start out with a little bit of context and then move the rest of the morning taking a look at uh, two specific encounters that Jesus has. One, a parable that he tells. The other, uh, in, in exchange with those who tried to trick Jesus because of the parable that he told. So um, the way that we're going to kind of break this down together this morning is uh, we will see this, and this is three P words, alliteration is wonderful. We have a parable, a penny, and a big ugly problem. A parable, a penny, and a big ugly problem. And so as we look at this together, we're going to see how Jesus really confronts self-righteousness. And I want to be clear what self-righteousness is at the outset, because there are uh, misconceptions about self-righteousness. A lot of times people think self-righteousness is just people who try to live God-honoring lives. Okay, for me, I grew up in a church where that was the kind of way that we, we perceived people uh, who sought to honor Jesus, like, oh, you're just a self-righteous person. That's not what self-righteousness is. Self-righteousness actually belongs to every human being by nature because what self-righteousness is, it's, it's this internal desire to justify yourself in the sight of God. And whether that comes in the form of, of using the Bible itself and trying to find a way where you can justify yourself in the sight of the God who is clearly revealed in Scripture, or whether it is coming up with a God to suit yourself, some type of idolatry, or just some type of moral system, everybody has this desire for self-righteousness. We want to be right, and we hate it when people tell us that we're wrong. We just despise when people tell us that we're wrong. And so the self-righteousness that we see here in this particular context is a self-righteousness that's couched uh, in the lives of people who are very well acquainted with Scripture. And while that is less and less the case today, most people really don't know the Bible's too well at this point. They, they don't know their Bibles too well. And so they can't necessarily be accused of being self-righteous the way the Pharisees were. They looked at the Bible and they said, okay, uh, this is how we can make ourselves right with God by, by being obedient. And God is going to be really impressed with us. Still, what remains is that every human heart has this inbred, inborn desire that we want God to look at us and say, you are good. You are great. And you are great on your own terms. And that's where we're gonna kind of move this big, ugly problem. This big, ugly problem is self-righteousness. It's pride. It's this desire that was set in front of uh, Eve and Adam before the fall, where this, the, the serpent comes and says to humanity, he says to us, you, you will be like God. Set yourself in his position. Take his place. Be like him determining for yourself what is good and evil. That is a big, ugly problem, and it is the most fundamental that we face as human beings. We'll get to that, and we'll see how it's displayed here in these interactions that Jesus has. So I'll read for us the passage, Luke 20, verses 1 through 26. Buckle up, longer passage again. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things, or who it is that gave you this authority. Jesus answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived 
that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere, that they might catch him in something he said, so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. So they asked him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their craftiness and said to them, show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. He said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said, but marveling at his answer, they became silent. Here's your big idea for the morning. Take a picture of it, write it down, whatever you like to do, but this is important to know. The most basic problem we own as human beings, and I want to stress we own it. This is ours. This is our problem. The most basic problem we own as human beings is an inborn desire to supplant God and his good rule, which can only be undone by the one whose rule we seek to throw off. So as human beings, we have this inborn desire to look at God and say, I want your place. I want your position. I want to take it. I want it to be mine. I don't want you to tell me what to do. I don't want you to tell me what is right. I don't want you to tell me what is wrong. I want to decide that for myself. That's our inborn desire. We're constantly telling children, no, 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 don't do that. That's our inborn desire. And if that's our inborn desire, that's our heart condition. We go through life and, and you don't want to change who you are yourself. You can't look at yourself and say, I, I think who I am is fundamentally wrong, so I'm going to change that to be fundamentally something else. So if you are a rebel, you act rebelliously. And the really, really exciting, wonderful thing about the gospel is that the one whom we have rebelled against and the one whom we want to supplant is the only one and is indeed the one who will reconcile those rebels to himself. So I want you to see this morning as, as you hear Jesus's words and, and you perceive his interactions with these people, these people who were seeking to kill him, that even as Jesus calls them out, and even as he lays them out and says, you, you are proud, arrogant people. He tells a parable to say, this is the type of people you are. You are like those who work in a vineyard and they see the heir of the owner of the vineyard and we want to kill him so we can steal his stuff. I mean, this is the type of people you are, that this is still the Jesus who has come and who has entered Jerusalem in these final days in order that he might lay his life down to rescue these types of people. So we desire to supplant God in his place and his rule and his authority. And yet it is God alone. And it is God who indeed does move in to change these hearts and the rebellion that we have by nature to make us lovers of God. That is a remarkable, wonderful, miraculous thing. It's the miracle we celebrate as a church. We don't look for gold dust to fall from the ceiling. We look for God to change our hearts. So let's see. Let's see this interaction. Let's see how pride rears its ugly head again. So Luke 20, verses 1 through 2. One day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things, or who it is that gave you this authority. So as Jesus presses into Jerusalem, his person penetrates the power of pride that captivates even and sometimes especially the most religious hearts. So here's what's happening. We have Jesus who has spent the past two and a half, three years going about and doing some really remarkable things. And the remarkable things don't just involve him uh, demonstrating that the king has come and how he is healing people and how he is opening the eyes of the blind and how even Lazarus has been raised from the dead. There's some amazing things that have happened that demonstrate and display they are signs that point to the fact that the king has come. And so they ought to listen to him. They should believe what he is saying because he is demonstrating with power exactly who he is, that the king has come, so the kingdom has come with him. But not only has he done these things, he has spoken words. And the thing that you should kind of perceive as you go throughout uh, the gospel accounts is that the, the leaders of the Jews were not necessarily concerned with what Jesus's power was, because their desire was to harness that power for themselves. 
And so as, as Palm Sunday, you, you have the, the, the people, the crowds who are just, oh, Jesus is here. Because they're thinking Jesus' power can be exercised on our behalf to further our own ends and our own purposes. So they're not upset with his power. They're not upset that he would even claim uh, this power as something that he owns. But they're upset that his words are being spoken in such a way that are offensive to them. Jesus' words are offensive And the reason why they are offensive has everything to do with the fact that as Jesus speaks to people, he is, he is opening up our hearts. He is, he is, he is cutting open little pockets in our hearts to show us what is actually there, what is actually going on. And so when, when you think about what's, what, when you have a diseased part, when you have a diseased uh, body part, a gangrenous leg or something like that, I mean, it is ugly, it's gross. And, and you might be tempted to say, well, I don't want to look at that. Okay. And it's, it's gross. You don't necessarily want to look at it, but you should be aware of it. And yet what we do by nature is we perceive these things about ourselves. And so we just ignore it. We put it aside and we think, okay, I can either take care of this myself or this disease part of me isn't as bad as the disease parts of other people. So I'm just going to focus on the disease parts of other people that I can see that they might not be able to see in order to assure myself that I'm really not that disease. I'm really not that bad. And so as Jesus speaks, what he's doing is he is making very clear to all of us, every single person, all you have to do is read Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Every single human heart as it's confronted by that is absolutely laid bare, opened up to say, you are in need of a heart change. And so Jesus' words have been offensive this whole time, from the, the, the day that he is publicly recognized through his baptism at the hands of John the Baptist, until this day, Jesus is going about and he is offending people left and right by exposing the need for forgiveness and the need for reconciliation with God. And so he's doing these things, and the natural response that the natural response is happening on the part of those who had who had developed quite a resume, quite a spiritual resume, quite uh, a, a reputation, in fact, for being those who were doing very well by God and who had obeyed God to the point where they had created a whole set of, of extra biblical laws to make sure they were really doing the right things. They hear these words and they think, man, we, we've spent so much time and effort trying to be people who hide these things. We don't want Jesus to expose them anymore. So here's what we must do with him. We must get rid of him. We must get rid of him. Now, this is as insane as going to the doctor's office and knowing that you have an infection. The doctor says, here's here's a problem. You have this wrong with you and, and I can heal you, but you have to let me use this scalpel and you have to let me do this work to perform the surgery, to remove this element from your body that is diseased and is going to kill you. And you're looking at the doctor and saying, you are an absolute fool. I can take care of this myself. It's going to go home and I'm just going to ignore it. And that's the end of the matter. In fact, if you accuse me again of being in need of some type of medical care or treatment, I'm going to show up at your home and I am going to kill you. This is what's happening. This is what is going on here in the lives of these people. They've been so offended that they're willing to kill Jesus. They have to get rid of him because he has spoken to them words deeply offensive. So I'm going to recount this parable for you again. Think about this is what's happening in in the hearts of those he's speaking to and how this must have come across to them. So Jesus told the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. The tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Now, I hope at this point you can see that Jesus is clearly talking that the tenants are these people. The tenants are the people, in fact, not just these Pharisees, but the whole people of Israel, who, if you are familiar with the history of the people, go all the way back to Moses, and they say, Moses, we don't want you, we don't want you, we don't want you. They have this history of saying, we don't want God's authorized representatives, we don't want God speaking to us, we want to rule ourselves. So, all the way back, this history. So he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. 
maybe ours. They wanted what belonged to this vineyard owner. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. They couldn't believe it. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. So as Jesus is interacting with them, most of the parables, to be clear, most of the parables that you read, they are, they are instruments that Jesus uses to teach spiritual truths with some obscurity. A deliberate obscuring of spiritual truth so that the people, as, uh, as God spoke through Isaiah, the people may hear, okay, and yet not understand. They might see and not perceive. They, they might get it, but not get it. And yet here, a unique thing happens where Jesus tells a parable and the people of Israel, even these hard-hearted leaders, perceive it's being spoken about them. So it's unmistakable at this point that Jesus is equating these people with those who would say to God, God is the owner, the vineyard. The vineyard is the kingdom of God. The tenants are the people of Israel who have been visited time and time again by those whom the owner, God, has sent to them in order to help them understand what their place is in this vineyard. They perceive this has been spoken about them, and they think, surely not. Jesus says, they'll be destroyed, they will be killed. They say, surely not. Now, I want you to imagine the place that they were in as they say, surely not, because they have been thinking, okay, aren't we doing well? Are we doing right? Aren't we good people? And it doesn't take long to survey the very scriptures that they say that they loved and prized to understand that God has been very clear for many, many hundreds of years that even these people who had this immediate access to the word of God have a big problem. Isaiah chapter five, we find these words. This is spoken before the fall of Jerusalem. This is a good 700 years prior to Jesus coming onto the scene let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes. But something happens. It yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste that shall not be pruned or hoed and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. And so... You have here this 700 years prior. The Bible's very clear. And if these people knew their history, as they should have known their history, as they claimed to know their history, they would have known that they are in a long line of those who said to God, we really don't want you to tell us what to do. Now, it looks different. It looks different. In different ways, we see this displayed. So you go back 700 years prior, and you see God judging the nation of Judah because they had said... As long as we mention God's name, we can kind of adopt the practices of the nations around us. So we call it syncretism. We take the worship of God as it's displayed in scripture, and we start putting things together with it so we can try to have the best of both worlds, which clearly seems like an evil thing. And so the people in the first century talking with Jesus would have said, yes, that was clearly evil. We should not do that. But there is a hidden problem here that should also be evident to them, even though it's, it's kind of beneath the surface, and it's this. As Jesus speaks to the people, and even as uh, a reference before the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus talks about, you've heard it said before that you shall not do this, but I tell you, and then he goes to the heart level. You've heard it said you shall not hate your brother, but I tell you, or that you shall not kill your brother, but I tell you, if you hate your brother, you've committed murder already. 
So Jesus says, this is something that you should have been well aware of the whole time. But in fact, what you've been doing is, well, you have tried to run away from this type of a heritage of saying, we're not going to be syncretists. We're not going to be those who marry the, the God of Israel with the gods of the nations around us. Instead, what we will do is we will see that this propensity in our hearts may exist, but we'll cover it up. We will cover it up. And as long as we look good to other people, that's the only thing that matters. And that's, that should kind of strike you as you consider the words of Luke 20 this morning, because a theme that repeatedly shows up is the theme that the, these leaders feared the people. They feared them. And I would argue that it's not just a fear of like, well, what will they do to us? It's a fear of, we care more about what other people think than what God thinks. And that's really at the heart of self-righteousness as we think, as long as I can look good in front of other people, that is what matters the most. So I won't be honest about my sin. I won't be honest about my need to be forgiven. I won't be honest about anything except what makes me look good. And everything else I'll just obscure and hide. And so the people have the same problem as just being displayed in different ways. The people just don't want God to be honest with them. So continuing on here in Jeremiah chapter 12. So we fast forward a little bit. Jeremiah is prophesying at the time of the fall of Jerusalem, a horrific event. And so God speaking to Jeremiah says these words, I have forsaken my house. I have abandoned my heritage. I have given the beloved of my soul into the hands of her enemies. My heritage has become to me like a lion in the forest. She has lifted up her voice against me. Therefore, I hate her. Very strong words. Is my heritage to me like a hyena's lair? Are the birds of prey against her all around? Go assemble all the wild beasts, bring them to devour. Many shepherds have destroyed my vineyard. They have trampled down my portion. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. Now, stop for a second. As God says, many shepherds have destroyed my vineyard. This could be in reference to just the people who have come outside nations, pagans who have come to assault physically. But I would say that there's more going on here than just the physical destruction that have been encountered by the people. Because what has happened, and, and, and you see this in Ezekiel, you see this in Jeremiah, these two prophets specifically, that God speaks of the leaders of Israel as, as really, really, really bad shepherds. People who had the responsibility of leading the people of God to seek God in truth, and they instead use the people of God to enrich themselves. And so the devouring, the destroying that's going on here is not necessarily an external thing. It's an internal thing. They've been doing this to themselves over and over and over again. So continuing, they have made it a desolation. Desolate, it mourns to me. The whole land is made desolate, but no man lays it to heart. They ought to have thought at this point, they ought to, maybe there's something going on. Maybe we should have listened to the prophets who warned us, but no one lays it to heart. Upon all the bare heights and the desert destroyers have come, for the sword of the Lord devours from one end of the land to the other. No flesh has peace. They have sown wheat and have reaped thorns. They have tired themselves out, but profit nothing. They shall be ashamed of their harvest because of the fierce anger of the Lord. Again, this is, this is history. This is not just some type of motivational speech. This happened in history. They would have known this happened. And the city they were dwelling in is a city that had been rebuilt after being completely leveled 700 years prior. So this is something they should have known. But as God spoke through Jeremiah here, they didn't lay it to heart. And they didn't lay it to heart in the first century either, as they considered John the Baptist coming and saying, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. They didn't consider that it was them that needed to repent. There was always somebody else. These people are worse than me. They need to repent, but I don't. And this hard-heartedness perpetuates itself, and it gets harder and harder and harder and harder and harder. Luke 11, we, we cover this a number of months back, so I want to bring it back into your memory so you can think about an interaction that demonstrates this earlier on. One of the lawyers answered Jesus, teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. And he said, woe to you lawyers. Now, 
To be clear, this is not woe to lawyers today. Don't use this out of context. Don't send this to an attorney and say, ha, you are nasty. Jesus says, woe to you because you're a lawyer. It's not what's happening here. The lawyers were those who took the law of God and tried to apply it in creative ways, very creative ways. So continuing, woe to you lawyers. Also for you load people with burdens hard to bear and you yourself do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses and you consent to the deeds of your fathers for they killed them and you build their tombs. Therefore, also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, who you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. As he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. So you see, this is a theme. Jesus speaks, they are provoked. Their self-righteousness is brought up, raised up, and they say, we gotta do something about him. We don't like him. And as Jesus pronounces these woes upon them, he's saying, you talk about monuments, Monuments to the prophets that your fathers killed, they are truly your fathers. Because you would have done the same thing. And this parable, this parable of this vineyard and these tenants in the vineyard is there to demonstrate that you are just like them. You are just like them. As he speaks to these people, you are just like them. In fact, what you will end up doing to me, Jesus is saying, is the most heinous act of any of these tenants in the vineyard because you will kill the owner. So moving on to a penny. Luke 20, 19 through 26. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere that they might catch him in something he said so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. So they asked him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said Caesar's. He said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said, but marveling at his answer, they became silent. So in the efforts to confound the unconfoundable and with the warning of a pointed parable, the proud reveal that they would rather be wicked tenants than humbled citizens. So the really strange thing about this, if you think about it, is that they're being warned. It's not too late for them. Now, obviously, in the plan and economy of God, the cross was going to happen. But if you think on this individual level, for, for these people, as they're hearing this, you would think that if they perceive this is being spoken about them, that there's another response that they could have had that did not involve them saying, let's go ahead and kill Jesus. It's a response that would have been, if this is about me, and I'm just like my fathers who killed and persecuted the prophets, then I need help. I don't want to be that type of person. I don't want to find myself in that position, in that place of being so filled with self-righteousness that I'm willing to look God in the eye and say no to you. I will kill your son. You would think, you would think that this being said would have given them pause. But in fact, it didn't. And I would say the reason for this is that apart from God working supernaturally by his spirit in the human heart, pride and self-love is so intoxicating. You, you can't divorce yourself from it. Pride is, is like a drug. It just gets in your veins and it won't get out. You love it. You love, you love how it makes you feel. 
You love how it makes you feel when somebody looks at you and just applauds you. Your self-glory, self-love. And even in the face of a warning, they're still thinking, okay, we gotta, we gotta preserve this. We gotta love this. We gotta protect this. We have to hold on to this with every fiber of our being. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna come up with creative ways to find that we can silence Jesus. That we can follow through in being the kind of people that we're being exposed to be. That is how intoxicating self-love is. So they come up with this insane approach. They want to get Jesus in trouble with the Roman authorities. And just say to him, hey, Jesus, we're going to say something that might implicate you. And Jesus, knowing them because he's not confoundable, says to them, a perfect answer, a perfect answer that just puts them to shame so that they don't, as it says here, have the ability to answer him, catch him what he said, and they just become silent. Hosea chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, I want you to, to hear, this is God speaking. Again, I'm, I'm trying to put these, these Old Testament passages in front of you so that you can, can put in context the fact that the people should have known themselves to be of a particular disposition, and should have been warned to run away from it. So even as they are going and using Caesar now, they're using this, they're invoking language of Caesar, the, the, the pagan authority over the land, and they're just trying to find a way where they can kind of get Jesus in trouble with him, because maybe he can take care of him. Well, we gotta do something about this. You go back to Hosea, who is before Jeremiah saying these words. He says, Israel is a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. The more his fruit increased, the more altars he built. As his country improved, he improved his pillars. Their heart is false. Now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will break down their altars and destroy their pillars. For now they will say, we have no king, for we do not fear the Lord. And a king, what could he do for us? This is the heart of the people here. God is saying to them, as you, as you prospered, as you were abundant, as you had the stuff you wanted, as you got the things that you wanted, you, you, the more you got, the more you used those things to further your self-love. The more stuff you got, the more you accumulated so that you could pat yourselves on the back and simply point to it and say, God really does care about me this much because I have all this junk. And I'm going to use this junk to further my own glory. I'm going to use this junk so I can sin. I'm going to use this junk to do whatever I possibly can. And the heart behind all of this, God is revealing them. He said, you've done all these things. You've multiplied these altars, meaning that you've multiplied idols. You've multiplied people and places to worship in the place of God. And he is quoting them in effect here by saying, they don't fear God. And they don't want a king. And if you're familiar with the Bible, go back to Judges and the refrain that goes in Judges over and over again is that the people did what was right in their own eyes. They just did what they felt like doing. And they were fine with it. And so as these leaders who should have known better, as they approach Jesus in this way, trying to get him in trouble, trap him with this, this crafty plan, this is in the background the whole time. Their fathers owned this heart and God judged them for it. And Jesus says, this is you too. This is you too who want to throw off rule and authority of God. You want to throw this off. And yet they persist in that attitude and saying, we're going to find a way to do it. Come hell or high water, we're going to do it. And literally come hell or high water, they did. This brings us to some good news. I promise you some good news. A big ugly problem and an unexpected solution. So verse 19 through 20, the scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies and pretended to be sincere that they might catch him in something he said, so to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. I just bring this passage up for you again, so you see this is really the crux of the matter. The crux of the matter is they don't like what's being said to them. They perceive that it's about them. They don't like being exposed for who they are, so they're going to find any possible way to do away with Jesus any possible way. Now, I want you to connect that with your own experience, connect that with the experience of people in the 21st century West and think, how, how do we do this? How do we 
find creative ways to dismiss Jesus's words. So I'll suggest a couple to you here. Uh, one creative way that we do this is to be selective, to be selective hearers. So what we might do is uh, we'll call it Thomas Jefferson approach. Thomas Jefferson had a Bible that he famously edited out. I don't like this. Now, that's really, really, really awful. It's terrible. You don't want to do that. But on one level, at least he's being honest. But he just didn't like it. So he edited things out. But as it pertains here to 21st century West, what do we do? We just we look at the Bible and say, I think I like these things. And so you might hear somebody say something to the effect of, well, I just believe in a Jesus who, and then dot, dot, dot. And you, you come to that individual and say, well, this, Jesus says this over here. This seems to be a little bit different picture than what you're indicating the Jesus who you want to believe in is. And they'll just say, well, the Bible is just written by men. So the question you might ask him is, why, why is it that you can trust this passage that you like and reject this passage that you don't like? And the reason has nothing to do with uh, academic integrity, has nothing to do with translational integrity. It has everything to do with the fact that we just don't like what God has to say. So we will selectively listen. This is the way that we do away with Jesus. We can't crucify him again physically. So we just take what he has to say and we dismiss the things we don't like. And we might give mention to the things we do. Another creative way that we might try to do away with Jesus is to say, you know, I'm glad Jesus works for you. I'm glad Jesus works for you. And, and put Jesus at a place where instead of being the one who is authoritative, whose words upon the people hung, as it says here, they just, they hung on his words. They loved hearing what he had to say because for those who had been called, those whose hearts had been humbled, they heard it like, oh, I just... This is true, and I love what's true, even if it means that there's something wrong with me that needs to be fixed by God. And so we'll just say something to the effect of, well, it's nice that Jesus works for you. That's, that's nice because you seem like the kind of person that Jesus would work for, but for me, I don't need Jesus. I need this. So we find these creative ways to do away with Jesus, just as the people here try to find a creative way to do away with him. And yet, though every fiber of our proud and self-righteous hearts would rather attempt to reign in hell than serve in heaven, God will have a fruitful vineyard filled with the people who live in love and humility supplied by the gospel. So I am not plagiarizing there. I'm going to tell you exactly what that's from. That is from John Milton in Paradise Lost. When, when Satan is speaking in Paradise Lost and said, it's better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Perhaps you're familiar with that. Maybe you've read that. Maybe you read it back in high school. But it is a famous statement that I think gives a very good picture of what pride leads us to do. Pride leads us to say, I would rather reign in hell and serve in heaven. I would rather have a place where I am at the center being glorified in hell than to acknowledge the goodness and authority and rulership of God Almighty. That's what pride leads people to do. And if we're left here, if we're left at this place, then... Judgment comes, and it is not going to end well for us. But the reality is, though this is every fiber of our being, everything in us wants to be this type of person that says, God, we I want to inform you of what is good. I want to let you know just how good I am. I, I want to do these things. God works miraculously in the human heart, which again, I just I want to emphasize, we, we don't look for gold dust from ceilings, a display of God's power. Some people do that. Some people look and, and they say, you know, how, how, we can, how we can perceive that God is actively working is if we see these, these circus tricks. Yes, that means God is working. But I tell you the truth, that the surest way to see that God is working is to see a human being who is bent by nature on reigning in hell rather than serving in heaven, changing to say, I, I don't care as long as I'm before the presence of this good king. I don't care what I'm doing because I have a need and only he can meet it. So I want you to see how God promises this and fulfills it. Matthew 27, we'll be, we'll be approaching this soon with Easter. At the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. 
So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? They shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So this is just building up and building up and building up. And yet God makes this promise. And, and this is something, again, is that people think their Bible. Read the Bible. Think about the Bible. Memorize the Bible. This should have been something that they thought of and said, oh, if only we might experience this. If only God might do this for us. Zechariah chapter 12. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. Not self-righteousness. Pleas for mercy. So that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Continuing on, verse 1 of chapter 13. On that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. So there's this promise made in the midst of all of this judgment, in the midst of all the people who are saying, there's something really awful coming here. And God is saying, I warned you time and again, time and again, time and again, that there is a problem and judgment will come. They have experienced this for themselves hundreds of years prior and to Jesus's very day as he's talking to these people in the first century saying there is judgment coming. There is something coming. Please, please, please turn away from it. There is a promise of mercy. And note to whom that promise of mercy comes. It comes to those who are pleading for mercy. This is why the tax collectors and the prostitutes found a place in the kingdom of God. It's because they knew they needed mercy. They were miserable in their sin. These Pharisees and religious leaders were quite comfortable in it because they had found a way to make it seem good. And the leveling message of Jesus as he goes throughout saying, you all have need, you all have need for mercy, you all have need for it. Come to me then, and you'll find rest for your souls. Come to me, come to me. I won't turn you away. Come to me. And yet these people in the proudness of their hearts said no. Well, this promise remains open saying, I'll pour out this spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. And a fountain's going to be opened up for anyone who's going to come and just say, I need to be washed clean. I need to be washed clean and see Jesus as the one who is going to wash them clean. And the ironic, poetic, beautiful reality is that this very act of evil that will be perpetuated uh, in the legacy of these men who have a whole history of like, we're going to do this, we're going to kill, we're going to kill, we're going to kill, we're going to destroy to cover up our self righteousness perpetuating this pattern over and over, culminating in the crucifixion of Jesus is this very act that they have brought into reality that is going to provide for mercy. It is the crucifixion of Jesus, and his death on behalf of sinners that will secure mercy, secure grace, secure forgiveness for those who will say, boy, that should have been me. That should have been me. I, I should die for my sin. And yet God is merciful and gracious enough to send his own son so that if I look to him and say, please have mercy on me, I'll find it. Over the coming weeks, we're going to work into the Easter narrative. We're going to work into this, but I just want you to see Jesus enters into Jerusalem here. He's having these interactions with people that even in the midst of all of this pride and self-righteousness that he's going so that those who will turn away from that and say, I need mercy. I need grace. I need forgiveness because I can't do this myself. He is more than willing to receive and to pardon and to welcome. So I'll just leave you this John 15 verse one. Jesus says, I'm the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. You think about this vineyard imagery. Jesus says, ultimately, you want to see what the true vine is, this fruit-bearing vine, it's me. And guess what? 
You can be a part of this vine. You can be part of this vine. Find yourself in me. Not on your own. Find yourself in me. Trust me. Rest in me. Find peace and wholeness in me. To do that, you have to say no to this garbage of self-righteousness that has polluted your soul and poisoned your veins from your very birth. But if you come to me, you're going to find that I am your vine. My father's the vine dresser. You're going you're gonna to get pruned. You're going to get changed. And you're going to be made whole. That's a beautiful promise. Worship team, please come on up. Let's pray together as we uh, prepare to sing. Father, we thank you for sending your son into this world in order to die, in order that we who recognize by your sovereign grace a need for forgiveness might find it and that we can know it is sure because Jesus suffered and died for us. I pray that as we close out this morning in song, it cause us to reflect on this in a way that produces joy. That we would be thankful, we would be glad that you did not leave us to ourselves. But you came and you hunted us down as a good and gracious vine dresser to graft us in and to give us life in Christ. We ask this in his name.